The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that results from listening to this podcast. <laughs> This is the Scream Kings podcast, and I'm Max George. Podcasts always say they're sorry instead of fixing things. Hello, everybody. This is going to be quite the amazing episode. Um, I'm more than delighted to be sharing the airways with the wonderful Joshua Sterling Bragg. Hey, hey. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, our favorite Nathaniel Darkish is away. It is a holiday weekend, and he would rather spend time with family than discuss all things horror and the demonic. So, you know, his loss, really. Right, Josh? Yeah, I don't know where the priorities lie. But... I know. Good grief. I'll talk to him after this show. Okay. <laughs> so we, we have a doozy of a show for everyone. We're going to be diving into the movie Anything for Jackson, which I think is a sleeper hit of 2020. I was blown away by this movie and i know you were too josh oh yeah absolutely it gives me chills to hear the title because i'm just so excited and as i was re-watching the movie and kind of taking notes and everything I, I just solidified in my mind of what an epic show this is you can find it on shutter if anyone is curious and if you're not using shutter and you're listening to this podcast definitely fix your life and go change that shutter is an amazing amazing streaming service that allows you to watch so many horror movies it just the click of a few buttons. It's essentially Netflix for horror fans. Yeah, and the Blu-ray isn't even released for this movie yet. I tried to look it up after I watched it for the second time. I was like, I should own this movie. And it's not even out yet because it went straight to Shudder. Well, I feel like this podcast will single-handedly create the Blu-ray. Um, just because we'll generate so much traction? Question mark. <laughs> Before we get too involved in the movie, though, um, let's talk about you, Josh. I am a millennial, and I found the beloved TikTok uh, last year when the pandemic hit us hard, and I fell in love with the stupid app. It's hilarious. It's funny. Uh, it's such a time waster, which is great some days. And a few weeks ago, I was flipping through it. I follow a lot of horror creators, and I found you, and you are amazing. The production of your TikToks and kind of the themes you were talking about, you were really diving into movies and talking about what their foundations were, what they really meant, and kind of the motivations and the inspirations for a lot of these classic horror movies. Needless to say, um, I fell in love because uh, it's really what we do and what we strive for here on the Scream Kings podcast, taking these beloved horror movies, kind of stripping them apart and finding the humanity in the horror, which this movie is so wonderful for that, and we'll get into that. Needless to say, I reached out to you, we're now best friends, and here we are, having you as a guest on the show. So thank you, Josh. Do you want to maybe go into a little bit about who you are and kind of how you got involved in the horror world? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, TikTok is relatively new to me as well. I started in January out of boredom. My wife had been into it for quite a while, and it was just this annoying thing that was happening on her phone for a little bit and I, I stomped my feet and I was like, I don't like dancing. I'm not going to watch a TikTok. Um, and boy, was I so wrong. It is now my favorite social media platform by far. And I'm a photographer. My background is in cinematography and photography. And so Instagram, when it came out, I was like, I feel seen. I don't know. There's something magical about TikTok. It's so positive. But um, since January, I just reached this week, a hundred thousand followers. Oh, wow. Congrats. A million likes. Which just feels absolutely unreal because my, my whole start in creating horror content was on YouTube. And after two years of doing it every week with a regular YouTube show, I got to 16,000. And I mm -hmm. thought that number was phenomenal. I thought like, <laughs> I can never do better with anything in the rest of my life than get 16,000 people to care what I'm saying on YouTube. And now there's 100,000 people who are like leaving comments and showing up to lives. And it's really 
mind blowing. Yeah, I think that is testament to the TikTok's algorithm. I've heard that same story from a lot of people, especially in the podcast world, where they were on YouTube for so long, they barely breached, you know, 5,000, 10,000 viewers or subscribers, whatever you want to call them. And then you switch to TikTok, and that algorithm just spits your videos out to so many people so fast that it really implodes. It really favors the person and the, the like the human as opposed to the content. It's not dissecting, you know, the quality of your content before feeding it to people and like your regularity or anything. It's just you made a video. Let's put it out and see what happens. Yeah. And I believe, you know, as a millennial and Generation Z, we have a very short attention span. And so to get that kind of content and information in under a minute as whatever anybody wants to say about that regarding our attention spans, uh, I think it's catering to the uprising generation. And it's really impressive, honestly. So that's TikTok. Um, but, you know, I started on YouTube in 2013. And so like my, my different properties are... Um, so I'm most active on TikTok because I'm posting every single day, usually in the evening um, and sometimes going live. And I talk about uh, horror movies, but I also talk about urban legends, hauntings and uh, folklore. And then uh, and that's mostly because I was trying to figure out how to do a video every day. I was like, well, it can't just be movies because I can't watch a movie every day. <laughs> um, but I'm doing like 13 or 15 a month, which is um, breakneck speed. And then my YouTube channel, I write and tell scary stories. Uh, with 360 degree soundscape. So it's like a movie for your ears. And then my podcast, oh, cool. I'm still trying to figure out right now. It just mirrors YouTube, but I want to start talking to people like this. Awesome. Well, if we can help and support and move you forward as any way possible, let us know. Yeah, we're partners um, now. Blood, that's that blood right. Packed. My hand is still healing it. Um, my hand is bleeding right now. So here we go. How'd you get into horror though, Josh? What, like, what was your horror origin story? So to say. I've always liked being scared. Um, and to be clear, I'm scared of everything. I mean, like darkness, <laughs> I feel that. mirrors. Um, actually, if we're talking about like my complete origin story, when I was in preschool, I cracked my head open pretending to be Superman. And instead <laughs> of rushing me to the hospital, they rushed me over to the seminary where my dad was studying to become a minister. And they <laughs> plopped me down in this stainless steel sink with big mirrors and most of my childhood, including when I went to college, I couldn't face mirrors in the dark because I would see that bloody image of myself. That is amazing and terrifying. And one of the most original like fears I've heard, I'm deathly afraid of goats and everyone always makes fun of me for that. But I feel like mirrors is a close second for weirdest thing people are afraid of. So yeah, well specifically mirrors in the dark. Yeah. Um, and I, I now sleep. I've worked through it. I don't exactly know how, but I've worked maybe from talking about it so much and from going on <laughs> ghost hunts with uh, groups, but Woo! I've worked through it. And I now sleep in a room that has floor to ceiling mirror closet, you know, because that, that was the house that we got. So I'm OK. Um, you made it through. Yeah. As far as like uh, when I started experimenting with horror films and stuff. My dad, I remember my dad telling me when I was in elementary school about seeing Alien. Um, that, that was just when he was talking about it. I think because he went and saw The Sixth Sense. And then we were kind of talking about, well, well, what is that? And why can't I go see it? And he mentioned seeing Alien in the theater. And he wasn't a big fan of horror or anything. But he appreciated a really good film when it was made and would like put himself through a horror movie once in a while. So I had this challenge in my mind of one day being able to sit through a scary movie myself. <laughs> and to be brave enough to do it. And then I don't know. I, I'm so bad with this stuff. My wife is like, you, you can't remember anything. <laughs> like, I don't know actors' names. I don't know anything. But I, I, so I don't know what my first scary movie was. But I know I started getting really interested around 2002 because some of my earliest ones were Signs and The Ring and The Grudge. All classics. Uh, so what movie do, would you say has scared you the most? The movie... The scariest movie, the scariest movie of all time. But I'm, I, I get a little like trepidatious about answering this because people give me such flack on TikTok all the time for my movie reviews because I like everything and I'm scared of everything. But, you know, I always tell them everyone has different taste and everything fi everyone finds different things scary. Well, and my philosophy, too, is, you know, these movies and cinema, they're designed to entertain us and they're going to entertain every like 
they're not going to entertain everybody, but they will entertain somebody, and there's merit to that to some regard. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, Little soapbox of mine. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that's, like, part of why the genre is so broad, you know? Why there's, like, 30,000 different subgenres in horror. There's exactly. no subgenres in, well, maybe there's a few in romance, but, you know, not significant ones. Nobody's watching those. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think the most scared I've ever been in a movie theater, it's a ta- I can't remember. It, it might be the ring, but I'm pretty sure it's the 2013 version of evil dead. Oh my gosh. We because can talk about that movie for days. Josh. I remember sitting in the theater. I was in that like middle row where you're like the front row. And then there's the space below the lower people. Ugh. Um, Oh, I shouldn't call them that. The, the below <laughs> seats, the less, <laughs> the less than seats. I will forever call them lower people when I go to movie <laughs> theaters now. Eat this popcorn, lower people. Um, so I remember sitting with my feet up on the seat and hiding behind my knees. And it was too, I, I was in my 20s. And I just like hugging my knees and, and like shaking from anxiety because it was so, it was so real and like visceral. And I remember seeing the trailer for it. And the part where she's sitting in the bunk bed and she says, I think there's something or it's in here with us. And I remember being like, oh, that's dumb. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to find that scene scary. And when the actual scene happened, I was like crapping my pants. I was so scared. Yeah. So I, I have a similar situation. I watched this at home, though, um, and I had never watched the original Evil Dead up to this point. So this was an entirely mm. foreign movie to me. And it put me off watching horror for a few days because it was so gut-wrenching it's it's incredible yeah it's graphic and violent and and just like they they get that whole they get demonic on like a whole nother level i want that exact team to make more movies yeah same all right well speaking of the demonic should we move into this incredible movie yeah anything else you'd like to say so help you god no i'm sure stuff will come up all right, all right. Let's talk about anything for Jackson. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. So you've seen, seen some ghosts, ghosts, huh? No one has more time than a grieving family. We can do this. He's coming back to us. Uh, this movie came out in 2020. The director is Justin G. Dick, D-Y-C-K, Dick, yeah. Dyke. I feel like I'm screwed either way. So thank you, Justin. <laughs> um, and then it was oh, written by... Thank you, by... Justin's parents. Uh, yeah, Mr. Dick. <laughs> and we really need to fix, fix the fact that men don't take women's last names, okay? You wouldn't be in this situation. No, for real, Mr. Dick. <laughs> and it was written by Keith, much easier to say, Cooper. Um, and again, like we discussed early on, it was originally re- released on Shudder um, during the pandemic times, which I think was such a disservice to it because I it would have exploded in theaters. Um, I haven't seen a horror movie like this since Hereditary. And Josh, I don't know if you've listened to a few of our other podcasts, but me and Nathaniel are incredibly in love with Ari Aster and A24 mm-hmm. and Hereditary in particular. So this felt like such a love letter to that type of horror and that kind of style of scaring us i was just blown away i'm so excited to talk about the movie yeah it's just really uh, both ari aster's films aster aster i feel like i'm screwed either way um (laughs) both his films and this one are rooted in uh reality they feel like they could exactly be happening next door in the house you know with the people you never reached out to or whatever and both tied to such human emotions that it's not the demon that is really scaring you in the movie. It's what these humans are capable of. So real quick side note, though, because I thought this was hilarious. Our director, Justin, censored last name, um, <laughs> is the director of like several different Hallmark Christmas movies, which I love and hate at the same time that there are just these undiscovered directors out there pushing out these popcorn Christmas movies, and then if you give them a little bit to play with, they create this beautiful masterpiece that is anything for Jackson. Yeah, and then does he just go back to doing Hallmark movies? 
Yeah, how how can you go back to that, though, is the real well, question. Actually, sidebar, M. Night Shyamalan apparently has written almost every romantic comedy you've ever seen in the past, like, 12 years. And that's where he's been and what he's been doing. You know, so, I mean, that tracks, I feel like. <laughs> Shyamalan Malamalan just, like, goes rogue, and then you find out he's been doing all these romance movies. I feel like that is very much his M.O. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, and get it, you know? Like, I, I mean, we could go down such a rabbit hole with Nick Cage, so I won't even bring him up. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> we have very strong feelings about Mr. Cage on this <laughs> podcast, and none of them are positive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, just, again, a forewarning to all of our listeners. Uh, this is a Spoiler Zone podcast. We don't shy away from spoilers in any which sense. And this movie, I think, is much more appreciated if you go into it not knowing what it's going to happen so if you haven't seen this movie please stop listening to the podcast it's on shutter it shutters like four bucks a month you can figure it out watch it come back to us so we're gonna get into the nitty gritty here i would even say don't even watch the trailer like yeah it's a strong enough suggestion i don't think you need to even watch the trailer to be like is it for me if you like intense horror like we've been talking about just do it um all right josh give me like a two three sentence summary of the movie just to kind of give us some context (laughs) okay this will be the hardest thing you have to do today and then we'll dive into what we liked about the movie all right great let me just do a quick prayer to satan um so Uh, (laughs) satan there are so many more demons you could be praying to right now satan's not gonna help you anything for jackson is the story of an old couple who has lost their grandson in some sort of tragedy and they are decided they've decided to do a reverse exorcism by kidnapping a pregnant lady and putting the spirit of their grandchild into her womb that was perfect thank you (laughs) i'm exhausted I know. Okay, we'll take a break. Go grab a drink. (laughs) Um, All right, so that summary of the movie really is the entire plot at its core. We learn a lot about the past and what happened to these poor characters to get them to this point. And then, of course, there's the action and kind of the resolution of the movie. But really, the premise is very simple. You have two grieving grandparents, Audrey and Henry, and they are trying to get their grandson back at with any means possible. And the first thing when I was re- writing our notes, the, the positives of this movie is I felt the pacing was impeccable. Mm. Um, I am always complaining about the pacing of movies. Even the best movie out there for me sometimes starts to slip when it comes to pacing. And I think that the start of this movie, the development of its plot and its storytelling, and then the finish and finale was incredibly thought through um the designers of this movie and the production crew really knew what they were doing from start to finish i feel like and i wasn't really left wanting for any sort of pacing change how about you yeah i completely agree and i i think there was a moment a short brief tiny little moment where i started wondering like this all seems like it's getting out of control. Like I need some sort of explanation. And at that exact moment, like a second later, they started explaining things in a way that made the whole thing make sense. Yeah. And it starts out so very simple and smooth. You see this couple, they have this house. They're kind of enjoying their breakfast this morning, you know, very nonchalant. And then the doorbell rings, the husband leaves And then all of a sudden, he's kidnapping this girl, pulling her into the house. And it just goes on like nothing is wrong. And that's how the movie starts. And you're just kind of left breathless saying, well, what the hell? What's going on? It almost starts out kind of funny because he he, it's all in this like super wide shot. The first two minutes of the film. And he's complaining about how she hemmed his pants one leg a little bit shorter than the other. And people at work are going to think he's some kind of rapper guy. And She's like, oh, no one will think you're a rapper. Like, and there are these two people in their, what, late 60s? 
Yeah, and so you have this kind of mind game of there are these two elderly people, and elderly people never do anything bad, and they're talking about pants, and then all of a sudden there's a kidnapping. And it really just starts to play games with you from then on. And kind of going off of your point there, Josh, I think one of the highlights of this movie is it is a demonic possession movie. It is gritty, it is graphic, it is visceral, but I have never loved two protagonists, I don't even know if they're protagonists, like I have Audrey and Henry. The way they are portrayed, their dialogue with each other, their relationship, it is all so authentic and charming in the worst kind of ways because they've kidnapped this pregnant woman and they plan on, you know, using her as a sacrifice to a demon. And yet you love them and you kind of want them to succeed and you're just like, what is going on? Because they're older and they're adorable and they're quirky and they're funny. And they obviously love each other very much. And they're trying to do right by their family while they, and, you know, and they have this hard set rule in the beginning of like, we're not going to hurt the mother. Right. So like, it's all good intentions, except like this baby, you don't even know yet and didn't even want probably arguable, but didn't even want at one point, um, you know, it's just going to have a different personality that, that will then take. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> It's just baby stealing. Yeah, no big deal. Uh, But that is like the juxtaposition of this entire movie is it is this couple doing terrible, terrible things. And yet you are rooting for them the entire time. Because, in my opinion, their motivations, while not just, are good. They're just trying to reconnect with that love that they've lost. And we've all been in that position. And I really think it talks to the theme of the movie is what would we do for love? What would we do to end our grief? Would we go as far as kidnapping and, you know, infant side to some regard? Yeah. Oh, man. (laughs) And that's the first five minutes, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome Uh, to our eight hour podcast about a 90 minute movie. Mm, The Scream Kings is now a live stream. (laughs) For me, too, in the movie, I think that all of the additional characters that we see, um, the kidnapped girl, the neighbor, even their friend Ian, to some regard. I have some beef with Ian. We'll get to that later. Mm. Everyone seems very authentic. And what I appreciated a lot was oftentimes in horror movies, we have characters who are presented with these very nefarious or tumultuous moments and they just seem to make the most stupid decisions that anyone could ever make and this movie i didn't feel like did that very much the the captive girl um and i'm spacing her name i think it was rory was the girl i honestly don't know i i watched it yesterday for the second time and i still don't know i think it's like kind of purposely kept muddled a little bit because she's not really as important No, and that's kind of what I was getting at, that she kind of fades into the background, but she still is thinking for herself. She kind of starts to manipulate Audrey and Henry a little bit to get her way, and is kind of conniving through the entire plot, and I think that is very important to see in horror movies, that not everyone in real life is just going to poop the bed to some regard. They're going to think about it, make important and cognizant decisions. Yeah, and and you're kind of set up to like her less because one of the reasons she might not keep this baby or or it ends up maybe even being a reason she does keep the baby is because she doesn't want her mom to call her a failure again. You know, it, like she's she's a weak person. Um not that anyone who has that feeling is a weak person, but the, like I feel like that's what they're, the filmmakers are trying to tell you about this yeah. person. It's like they're weak, they don't know what they want, they don't know who they are. And they're le- you're left with this like muddy version of a person who like, no, you don't want them kidnapped and chained to a bed and their baby stolen. But also like, uh, I don't know, Henry and Audrey are kind of cute. But I think that's what their motivation was, too. I, I think the director was very um, intentional in making us feel like this for this captive girl, because that's what Audrey and Henry thought about her, that she's, she won't be missed. She doesn't want this baby. We don't have to care about her. 
uh, this is for her good. You know, you see that that mm-hmm. that reasoning and that bargaining start to play out with them, and it it doesn't work at the end of the day. But I do want to give credit to all of the actors in this film because I thought it was absolutely superb, especially Audrey, who was played by Sheila McCarthy, and Henry, who was played by Julian Richings. I have not seen either of these two in any other movies, but I was wildly blown away with their performance. Audrey in particular, Sheila McCarthy, I thought was this kind, you know, benevolent old grandma who also is a necromancer. And it just, it worked. It was so bizarre, but it worked. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And as someone who works in the industry, I don't do a lot of narrative stuff, but even just working with normal human beings, you know, in, in a documentary format, people get weird around the camera, you know? So like the the fact that we haven't seen these people before and they do these extreme close-ups at times where you can see just their eyes and their nose and their mouth and the subtleties of their acting is so spot on. You never for a minute doubt that they're real. Yeah. And again, I think that's a testament to this movie is the authenticity behind it really started to become unsettling when some of the scarier moments started to ramp up really quickly. I want to talk about some of the scarier moments. I want to talk. I have some specific things I need yeah, to pull I, up because I, I don't know. You know, we haven't talked about this ahead of time. And there's a lot of like hidden stuff in here or like stuff you miss on the first watch. Yeah. Hit me, Josh. OK. So, well, one, I just want to point out my favorite lines of the movie happen in succession. It's, it's Henry and Audrey talking there. She's showing Henry. Audrey is showing Henry how she can bring a crow back to life. And he says, we can't be bringing dead things to life. And she just says, I can, I've been doing it all morning, (laughs) which makes me really wonder like what kinds of things and where are they and what are the repercussions of, you know, you talk about the butterfly effect. She's been like aliving things all morning. (laughs) Yeah. Little old, you know, Mima Audrey is a necromancer in the mornings before her like afternoon tea. I think it's just bonkers. (laughs) Oh, there's, there's some like really cool camera tricks. You know, like you see Jackson at the very beginning, and this is something I wanted to actually, I wanted to ask you about too. So you see Jackson at the very beginning and Audrey and Henry cannot see him, but the mother can. Um, And nothing has really been done to her other than being kidnapped yet, but she can see him and he says, aloha means hello and goodbye. So she can hear him. And then he's off playing in the corner and he pops up from time to time throughout the movie, including one of the final shots. Why do you think she can see him? So we're talking about the captive girl, correct? Seeing yeah, Rory yeah. or mother. You know, there are a few things that I kind of noticed. As a, a demonologist, so to say, and an occult fanatic, there was a lot of stuff in that room that seemed to be kind of calling to the spirits. I noticed that there was a sigil etched on the bed and a few other things kind of scattered throughout the room, symbology here and there. And so I wonder if that kind of had something to do with it that in in a way they were making an unholy sanctuary for these entities to kind of approach and and maybe the veil was thin so to speak for Mm. a captive woman and so she was able to see jackson i however would argue that it never was jackson whoa i think that with their preparation and with sweet little mima audrey's necromancy that the demon who we talk about a little bit later, Sorgat, um, was kind of feeding on their grief. Uh, demons, in some regard, are very similar to poltergeists, and they like to feed on grief and mental illness and depression, anxiety, all of that. And so I think that was kind of a spin on that, that this demon was already manipulating Audrey and Henry before that girl even got there. He was kind of pulling the strings or she demons can be female too. As we see in the end. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I don't want to jump too far ahead because I have my notes in chronological order. So. Um... No, you're good. Uh, so maybe let's kind of dive into that. So H- yeah. Henry and Audrey do kind of start this ritual of they're not trying to summon a demon per se. They're trying to summon the spirit of Jackson to enter and inhabit the unborn fetus of our captor who will remain unnamed until we can figure that out. Um, And we find out later from one of their friends that they actually didn't do that. They essentially just opened a door. 
and so all of these different spirits, these ghosts, and this demon are now trying to take over, possess the weakest soul that they can find, because it's the easiest to possess. And, of course, Audrey and Henry are assuming that it is this captive girl. Little do we find out, it kind of blows up in their face, and the demon possesses them. And so by opening this door, this is where the real horror kind of starts in the movie. They perform this ritual, they see this entity, and they know it works, but then they start seeing other entities, other spirits, and man, it is terrifying. I, I IMDb'd kind of the cast, and there, you know, is the trick-or-treat ghost, the flossing ghost, the giggling ghost, the suffocating ghost, and the contortionist ghost, who by far is the worst, I think, in my mind. Um, you talk missed to us. one. Oh, did I miss one? I thought you I got missed them all. one at the vi- no at the very beginning when when all this stuff starts going down and they're like cutting their hands open over the the heart on the floor uh, <gasps> and, right. and like pumping blood into her nose. There's this giant bird headed thing. Yeah, a skinless head bird headed thing. That's right. Yeah, okay, so again, why this movie is so good, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's enough scary to forget about some of them. <laughs> exactly. Um, and what I really appreciated is a lot of these ghosts were kind of a combination of special effects and physical effects. Um, like the flossing ghost, for example, was just brutal. She's kind of flossing her teeth so much that her teeth are kind of popping out and falling onto the ground, and it's bloody. And you hear this kind of scraping noise it just gets under your skin and makes you kind of boil inside. Um, yeah. And the contortionist ghost, too, kind of crawls out from our captive girl's bed and gets on top of her. And it's just that unnatural way of body movement that makes you feel gross because it is not supposed to work like that. Bodies should not twist and turn like that. But it's not demonic. It's not these kind of demon seizures that this ghost is performing. It's just contortion. And it's so good and scary and makes you just kind of pee a little. (laughs) And it really really works in this movie. I recently saw Separation in the movie theater. If you don't know what that one is, the trailer has this, like, guy in striped pajamas with a long pointy nose uh, and a pointy chin. And he's like a little marionette turned into some entity and he does a similar sort of crawling in that crab walk and his head kind of contortioning and stuff. And it doesn't work at all because they used like way too many bone cracking sounds. It's one of my biggest pet peeves in horror (laughs) movies is when like every scary creature has like a bajillion cracking bones constantly. Like they can't make any arm (laughs) movement. They can't twist their finger a little bit, like come here without it being like, (laughs) It's like there's not that many bones in the body. Sorry, that's my one rant. But in this movie, they um, they really minimized it. I feel like the sound design was good. And, you know, you got a little bit of that because, of course, you should have a little bit of that. But it wasn't just like the entire time. You got to be scared by the ghosts and not just think about the cracking bones. So, Josh, who is your favorite of all of the ghosts? <laughs> it's the floss lady. Um, yeah, hands down, because... The the first time I watched it, I watched it on. Is it wh- is it because she was looking in a mirror? Is that why you were so scared? Sorry, I had to. There's a mirror moment that you might not even know happened. Ah, plot twist D- again. Jokester. Um, yeah. So so the first time I watched it, um, I watched it on my iPad, and I was like cleaning my office, and I kept like looking over my shoulder, and eventually became so engaged that I didn't clean my office. Um, but I watched it with the audio coming out of my iPad. This last time I watched it with noise canceling headphones and that's when I heard the teeth falling on the ground, which made it exponentially worse for me because there's the cracking in the floor. She's walking. There's a a floss in her mouth and just like like ripping her gums apart. But then there's the teeth falling to the floor. And then there's this scene where, sorry, I went to the IMDb to figure out that Becker is the name of the mom. And I need to go back to the show notes. Okay, Audrey and Henry. I told you I can't remember actors' names or <laughs> I am the exact same way. We're you're in happy company here. So Audrey and Henry are in bed, and she has this moment of doubt where she's like, "Are we sure we're doing the right thing?" Or, I don't know some shit like that. She turns out the lights. Do you think? Do you think we are in over our our heads? That's okay. So 
Mrs. Walsh, Audrey, is sitting in bed next to her husband, Henry, and she says, do you think we're in over our heads? Uh, I and remember he says, it now. Well, we can't Google this, which is a great response for an old man to have. And he just turns over and immediately falls asleep. And the camera's moving the whole time. And right as she turns out the light, you hear a tooth fall on the floor. And yeah. in the mirror in the bathroom, there's what I assume is the flossing lady again, but she's not flossing. She's just standing there with a bloody nightgown. Ugh, that is right. Wow. Again, like this movie has so many of these moments that are really so troubling and unsettling that you kind of forget them because there's one coming up in five minutes. Yeah. And they're not all like things crawling at the screen. It's stuff happening right. in the background. I, I read something on IMDb. There's very few like trivia about this, but that the director hid three ghosts within the movie. Um, and on the IMDb, only two of them had been found. Yeah, I read that same thing. And now, you know, it makes me want to watch it all over again to try and, and find them. So they did a similar thing on Haunting of Hill House. There's apparently yeah. people standing in shadows throughout the entire thing. It's fun to look for. Um, an excellent piece of of tv as well all right um let's move along but before we do i did also want to mention the snowblower incident um <laughs> this neighbor guy of theirs is just so concerned about snowblowing their house that felt a little corny to me that he was just this really good guy who just wanted to snowblow the house and, and his name is rory him. that's the rory all right mr rory and they don't want to let him because, of course, they have this poor girl upstairs, captive. But he eventually starts to, and the ghosts or the demon, whoever we want to say it is, kind of propels him into the snowblower. And God, they do not hold back on this. You just get a meat shower all over. And it's just a little traumatizing in the best way. Again, the sound design matching Ugh. what's happening. Like... Right? Oh, because there, there, there's this, you know, when you put something that isn't meant to be in something else, there's this moment where the machine goes, what? Oh, OK. You know, so like he shoves his head in there and it's like instead of just like, it's like, we're going to have you on all of our podcasts so that you can do your sound effects for us. You know, sound guy. The um, floss was really good. The snowblower was great. You you have a career with us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Residency of uh, the Scream Kings. So after that, a tooth gets embedded in the sliding glass door. Yeah. And that's the second time teeth have been referenced in this movie. Which makes me like want to think, what do teeth mean? Right. So... I've been trying to figure that out. And I was hoping you'd be like, well, Josh, you idiot. Here's the answer. Well, <laughs> let's talk about our mouth bones. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about something I do know a lot about. That is demons. Um, as kind of an amateur demonologist, I don't want to pay to get like my official demonology license. Um, I also don't want to go back to religion school. So I'm just a self-proclaimed <laughs> demonologist. Um, the lore that was in this movie was on par with Hereditary. I think Hereditary did it a little bit better, but the grimoire that they were using this idea that they've opened up a gate and not just the demon is going to come through uh, they're suffering they're grieving being manipulated by these entities and then even this like ragtag team of satanists that meet in the public library and probably assign someone that week to bring refreshments like this entire idea of popular pop culture demonology we're meeting in the library to talk about these scary things um <laughs> that and then behind that the actual summoning of a demon and the darkness and kind of terror that that can be for a lot of people um i was blown away it was so fun and it, and it did it so breathlessly um if that's a word i don't know it's fine uh, we're yeah. talking about demons, so we can do whatever we want. It was, um, it was without breath. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did it in a way that didn't feel cheesy, but we all kind of knew that, you know, Audrey and Henry were, were, they were gambling with the real stuff, and this group that they were meeting with was a means to an end. 
and I just I loved that kind of aspect of it because it, again it brought that realism to the movie that this movie does so well and it it just totally reinforces a lot of the fears I've had my entire life about accidentally doing something wrong that I can never <laughs> take back and ruins my entire <laughs> life like the, <laughs> that 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 like when it comes to taxes is scary um and then you start you know the supernatural like i said i've been on a couple of ghost hunts and the group that i went with we were always very careful to be like you know go somewhere where there were positive stories of like oh yeah there's a little boy and he kicks a ball down the hallway if you're not looking you know stuff like that we never are like oh cool an axe murder let's go spend the night there um (laughs) because i'm very cautious about this stuff i refuse to even touch i've never in my life touched a Ouija board because I am so terrified of them. Josh, I have a I am right now sitting with my Ouija board hanging right above me, so the ghosts are a coming. Just I'm going to end this podcast with goodbye. All right. And Josh is gone everyone. It is uh, n- now Close. just now just me. <laughs> Um, I do want to know though too that I, I loved how Audrey and Henry were not perfect in what they were doing, and I think that talks to your fear that one little slip up, one little mistake in these places that have such powerful negative energy can really draw out terrifying things. Well, and also their group is—I um, don't want to say a sham, but it—it's a sham. The person who's leading it doesn't even believe in it, which we find out later in the film. Um, and the the one person in the group who seems to really believe in it is this guy that you have a, a beef with who you're going to fight later. I am. And I'll probably win because he looks pretty scrawny. His name Kyle? Keith? Um, Ian. Ian. <laughs> I have a best friend named Ian, but fuck Ian. You can- <laughs> <laughs> yeah fuck ian let's just get that out of there um so yeah they have this group that is kind of a sham its leader is you know this very pragmatic woman um who talks a big talk but then later when we find out ian is really invested in this she kind of shits her pants and leaves henry and audrey alone when they're trying to figure out what to do um we find out that ian is so committed to summoning this demon he actually kills his mom uh, and uses her blood in a lot of the rituals kind of at the the climax of the movie. Oh, and the reveal of that is so good because you don't know he's killed his mom. He shows up with a little cute Tupperware container and adds some blood to the salt line and uh, is like, you know, this this is really going to do the do the stuff this is gonna be great it's a sacrifice you know and you're like okay you know dude cool necklace but then later as you find out from the phone call that he's killed his mom you're like oh god oh god the top the tupperware container (gasps) the sacrifice (gasps) ew ian (laughs) ian you dick and that you know, I think I, I have some issues with that, and we can talk a little bit more once we finish with the good. But it is all very true to true demonology that whenever you are summoning an inhuman entity like a demon, there's always some sort of sacrifice, whether that is part of your soul or you're making a contract with someone or giving up power, whatever you want to call it, that demon will take something. And so him sacrificing his mom really was a huge kind of moment that I'm willing to do this for you, demon. What are you going to do for me in return? And as a, an amateur demonologist, that was pretty powerful to watch. So I want to ask, because I, I don't, I, I grew up in the church, not the satanic one, <laughs> the other one. And um, like I, I said, also my dad's grew a up minister. in a church as well. So that's right. Kindred and spirits. Yours was a little bit different than mine. It was. So. Church of Satan or the Satanic Church has been getting a lot of attention recently because they um, allow protection of female autonomy, you know, that your ability to control your own body in your own way, as opposed to, um, you know, all this stuff kind of going on politically. And I don't want to get too political. But what, what I wondered was, so obviously, this is a group meeting in a, in a library basement. 
but does it do injustice to the Church of Satan or the Satanic Church um, oh. by having these characters be these um, demon slaying old book Jerusalem buying you know weirdos? A hundred percent. If you look at kind of the creed and the dogma of the Church of Satan, you're going to find out that it's incredibly different than what people make it out to believe. The Church of Satan is all about kind of the Luciferianism of you know the Renaissance that. Lucifer is a being of light. He's a being of agency and self-autonomy. And so really in the Church of Satan, what they talk about and focus on isn't this, you know, cabal of evil baby-eating liberals. It is <laughs> finding out what makes you happy and not letting anyone stop you from that happiness within the bounds of morality and ethics. No organization can tell you what to do with your body. No organization can force you into making decisions like a lot of christian churches do um and so they take that adversarial luciferism and kind of twist it on its head and makes it very empowering so these movies while they're true in their demonology what i mean by that is if you look through the lesser key of solomon or the grimoire verum these books that are talking about actually ritually summing dark entities to do your bidding that's where it's true. But demonology and the Church of Satan are very, very different, believe it or not. You put that so beautifully. Um, I have nothing to add. I'm just glad that we, uh, we did that little bit because I don't want, uh, you know, I don't want anyone being pissy. <laughs> uh, people are always pissy. <laughs> but that, no, that I brings... just don't want to offend anybody, you know, because it's, um, no. you know, we don't want to, we don't want to be spitting lore out there that's going to hurt anybody else. Um, and if, talk about. if there is someone who belongs to the Church of Satan listening to this podcast right now, um, my Twitter handle is at Crowley Finn, P-H-O-E-N, and I would love to talk to you, and we'll be best friends, and I'll invite you over, I'll read your tarot, and I'll give you a drink, because I have yet to meet someone. I live in Utah, and oddly enough, the Church of Satan, not a big deal around here. <laughs> but that leads me, though, into kind of a, a discussion I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, Josh, especially knowing that kind of this dark and spooky energy kind of creeps you out a little bit more than maybe a few of our other guests that we've had. Oh, God. Mm. Um, I, I have it in my notes as the catharsis of demons, which makes me sound much more intellectual than I really am. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, I kind of wanted to discuss with you, you know, Audrey and Henry do these terrible things and they're petitioning a demon on their behalf, essentially. And, and why is it that humanity kind of turns to the dark when things get rough? Uh, one of my favorite horror movies is called The Taking of Michael Caine. It's about a guy who loses his daughter and he just kind of has a mental snap where he wants to do anything in his power to bring her back. And so that leads him to try all of these very religious and occultish items to, or rituals, excuse me, sacraments, whatever you want to call them, to try and bring her back. Because if he can prove that they are real, then that proves to him that there's an afterlife. And, you know, worse comes to worse, and he gets possessed and whatever. But he is talking to an individual who you know, says, I, I kind of went through the same thing and I was praying to God over and over and over and I just wasn't getting any answers to my prayers. I felt like he wasn't listening. He didn't care about me. So one day I decided, well, maybe someone else will listen. Maybe if I pray to someone else, they will listen. And that to me is, is very powerful. And I think it comes through in anything for Jackson as well. This old couple was just so traumatized by what happened to their their grandchild that the christian narrative wasn't enough for them or it didn't provide them enough relief and is it wrong for individuals to turn to the dark side of things to you know if they feel like god or gods or the universe isn't listening to them is it so wrong are we so quick to judge them for maybe praying to darker older kind of spookier entities i don't know what do you think oh gosh Oh no! I told you that the summary was going to be the hardest thing, and I lied. You lied because you're evil. You must I pray am. to Satan. I um, am. <laughs> it's the Ouija board above me. It's telling me to do this. God, I knew that thing. Um, you know, I, I, 
I identify as a Christian for one reason, and it's because I think Christ, the, the idea of Christ, the, the human or, or, you know, even if it's just lore, the idea is like to ju- like love, like that's it. You just love everybody, you know? And like, that's part of the reason why, like when I watch a movie and it's not that good, I'm like, oh, but they tried hard. I just love everybody so much. And to, to, to tie that into answering your question is I, I'm, I'm a very moral person. I'm a very ethical person. I try, I don't always do the right thing. I fuck up, but I try and live my life in a way that's at least like putting love out into the world and caring about people. So, you know, the fault of Henry and Audrey here isn't necessarily that they're evil. It's more that they're like, their love is being only focused on their family and they're not allowing it to like go everywhere. So they, they, they're, they're forcing themselves like, cause like, okay, for a guy to get into gynecology and be what seems like a very caring doctor and a very gentle soul to then take one of his patients and go against his oath and put them in harm's way. Like his love got misdirected, you know, Mm -hmm. he's worried only about himself or he's put up that barrier because he loves Audrey so much, I guess. And that's what she wants that he allows himself to go. I guess the question is, you know, is it wrong for them to pray to a different entity to try and get their outcome? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I do think the answer to everything is just like compassion and caring and love, even though it's like really hard to do sometimes. No, I, I fully agree with you. I think really the key to having a happy and successful life is loving yourself and loving others. Um, and when either of those kind of motivations start to become something else, that's where you get into problems. And I guess why I ask this question is I, I used to be a Christian um, and I kind of went through that same experience of, well, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm getting any love from these gods and deities that I've been told love me unconditionally. But I then in turn found a lot of catharsis and a lot of sympathy from these tragic fallen angels who've been through some things that to me resonated more. And what's wrong with that? If, if you resonate with that kind of a narrative and that sort of a belief, again, it, it all comes down to love and what makes us happy at the end of the day, in my opinion. Well, and that's kind of the ultimate story too. If you look at any movie, it's like, here's this person, you might idolize them and you might look at them in this way or that way. And then they screw up and the life starts to fall apart. And you're like, oh, I see you're like me, you know? So it makes total sense that you, you go that direction, you know, sure. because uh, how, how are you supposed to understand an all seeing all being entity that is like, uh, you know, after a couple chapters of an old book is like, you know what, here, kill my son, peace out. You guys do what you want to do. And, um, just know I'm watching always watching. Yeah, I get, I get that. All right. Um, now that we, you know, have given everyone a, an intro to philosophy class. <laughs> Theology 101. Yes, here with Josh and Max. Let's talk about some of the cons of this movie. And really, there's not a lot, in my opinion, unless you have more. Um, Let's find out. uh, Ian, for me, I struggled with Ian. I kind of felt like he was, of everyone we've met up to this point in the movie, he was the most kind of caricature of them all. Just kind of this stereotype, this misunderstood Satanist who lives in his mom's basement, listens to grunge and hard black metal, and is a Satanist. Like, it just felt very one-dimensional, and he just kind of annoyed me from the first time we met him to the end. That, uh, I want to touch on that. Because sure. the first time we meet him, he's this, like, squirrely, weak, you know, like, he's... He's looking up to Audrey and Henry for some reason. And, you know, they borrowed a book and he, they gave it back. And he was like, oh, you can keep it if you want. Like, he's trying really, really hard to. I don't know if he's just trying to make a human connection with somebody else because he's an, an outsider who never got a chance to, like, have friends. But, but these people are so, you know, they could be his grandparents, the age difference. And, and I don't, I didn't understand why he was, like, sucking up to them. And then later in the movie, he becomes this, like, 
metal listening badass who's like totally cool with killing his mom and going and like rattling wrangling some demons he felt like a very shallow character to me and essentially his purpose was to move the plot along to some Mm -hmm. regard and to piggyback a little bit on that when we first find out about this magical grimoire that is summoning this demon and he just essentially you know has a wet dream on screen in front of us all about this book that just felt really cheesy. I mean, all the demonology up to that point was pretty on par. And then talking about this mysterious grimoire that he found in Jerusalem. He just happened oh, God, to man. find in Jerusalem that he could afford with his retirement savings. And it I must know, be I, the oldest book ever written. It was just like, okay. But, that's, I where's... sometimes put myself in the writer's rooms and like try and imagine the conversations. They're like, guys, the movie's really solid, but where the fuck does this book come from? Like, oh, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, it's old, it's like soul, it's like from Jerusalem. And they're like, great, okay, cool, just like uh, put a line in. Yeah, I mean, we're, let's bring back Teeth Girl. Where's the ghost? <laughs> bring her <laughs> yeah. back. Last teeth, um, last teeth. But more the, um, te- teeth. More teeth, less teeth. Yeah. Um, the only other con I could say about this movie board, there were some scenes that were a little bit too dark. Um, I fully understand and appreciate that that's probably the intention there, but there were just moments where I was like, is it my TV that's too dark or is it the scene that's just way too dark and I need to like beef up my brightness? Yeah, I you know I had a similar issue. Like I said, I watched it on my iPad, and there was a certain point where I stopped the movie, it did the swipe, raised the brightness all the way, and then there was a second moment where I went and closed the blinds in my bedroom. So I, I, I thought it was just I was getting annoyed by the sun, but that makes a lot of sense. I think it was like some scenes were just a little too dark. Other than that, that is all I could say about the cons of this movie. Like. Had I seen this in 2020, I would have definitely rated it as best horror movie 2020 by mm. far. By far. Let me see. I'm going through my notes right now. They're they're like really little tiny things, but maybe fun to talk about. Um, in the beginning, where they uh, she reads her note and it's cute. They're like, oh, so we kidnapped you and my husband right here. Oh, he's not in the room. You know that scene. Um. <laughs> So then immediately after that, they're like, maybe we should do the test. And he's like, oh, ready? So he goes outside to hear if they can hear her screaming. And at that point, I was like, well, you guys didn't test that ahead of time. Like, you didn't have Audrey scream up there for like two minutes so you could test it out. Why now? Because I don't know. That is a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that does kind of undermine their strategy a little bit. Yeah, but it also it's a um, you know, it's a flaw. So it, maybe that was meant to like make them a little more endearing somehow of like, oh, they're they're figuring it out. Me but mom likewise, and papa are just trying their hardest to kidnap the right way. Yeah. <laughs> trying really hard and doing a pretty good job, I think. And then there's the guy who puts Rory. Rory puts his head in the the machine and then uh Henry has to dispose of the body. Oh. <laughs> and he sucks. At burying bodies, the so it's guy it's, though, like it's cut up in all different pieces, and he's like packing little bits of snow on top of it, and there's fingers hanging out of the bag. He's using giant industrial trash bags, and somehow a single arm is still hanging out of the trash bag and bleeding onto the snow. And he's like, pat, 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 pat. <laughs> He's just trying really hard. Yeah, he, he had a bad day. It's not every day that your neighbor gets his. <laughs> body thrown into a snowblower jesus yeah i don't know maybe it's the shock maybe it's the shock there we go and his arthritis his boniva probably wasn't working very well that day who knows oh did you notice now i'm just getting into like uh easter eggs or or something um but did you notice that the door to the bedroom never stays the way they leave it no i didn't so the th- like audrey will close the door and you'll hear her lock it and then right before the scene cuts the door will become a jar Ooh. or they open the door all the way and then they hang on the door like one second longer in each scene she'll leave it open and then it'll start to close and then they cut away oh i love that that's great I thought that was really cool oh yeah it's- Fucking loser guy. What's his name again? Ian? Ian. Ian breaks the salt barrier, which is the whole reason everything falls apart. Yeah, he crosses the salt. 
Ian. Gotta leave it to Ian. Man, what a jerk. Oh, so what do you think about... I think that's all I have, but what do you think about the ending? What did the ending do to you? Oh, no, I have one more Easter egg. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, please spill. One more Easter egg. The song at the very beginning is Daisy, Daisy, Give Me Your Answer, Do. And at the end, as the blood is pooling from Audrey and Henry into each other and this demon is crawling out from inside of his Mm -hmm. back, Mm -hmm. the song changed to Henry, Henry, Give Me Your Answer, Do. Ugh. Uh, and I think that's kind of where you were going. I definitely think full possession happened here. That our lovely little demon friend was able to get his dream and find a body. Yeah, and then is that the demon? Is that is it Surgot? Is the demon? Um, is that the demon on the road walking out of the woods at the end? Yes, I think so. Um, and maybe I just wanted it to make sense, and I wanted to have a win for all my demon homeboys. I think Surgot was kind of orchestrating all of this. If we shift on our podcast, Josh, we do what's called the occult corner, where I get to kind of nerd out about all of the occulty things in the world. Um, and the demon Surgot himself, it's a very lesser known demon. He's not mentioned a lot. He's a minor demon, and you find him in the grimoire of Pope Honorius. He was a Pope, Pope Honorius III, I believe who wrote this grimoire. It's the only demon book that was written for the clergy of the Catholic Church. Essentially, it's a guidebook on how to combat the demons. He's mentioned Whoa. there. And he's also mentioned in what's called the Grimorium Verum, which I am looking at right now. Um, <laughs> it, it is Love cool stuff. It is probably the blackest of all grimoires. It, is, it has blood magic, sex magic, um, it is a very, I don't show it to a lot of people because it is pretty intense. Um, but both of these books draw heavily from the Lesser Key of Solomon, which is kind of the Bible of demons. Um, and so Surgat, very kind of unknown, obscure demon. However, every reference to him talks about he who opens all locks. Um, and he's usually portrayed with a bird head, a black feathered bird head, which we've seen in the movie yes um and so i truly believe that it was his intention he found these grieving elderly individuals and he started to manipulate them to get him to come to life um and if you think about it kind of metaphorically as well he who opens all the locks he's opened the door to allow all these ghosts to come he wants a fetus because he's going to unlock the womb and take control of the baby um, but then also he unlocks the body of who he possesses and kind of crawls out of that creature. So there you go, Sir God, way to win. Wow, and like you were saying, the accuracy. I mean, you're describing these things, and it's literally what happens in the movie. Uh, a few other demonology symbols that I saw that kind of were Easter eggs for me um, is when they were looking through what I have termed the Jerusalem Grimoire, because it's the oldest book ever written. Um, there was a sigil of the planet Saturn, and Saturn is, uh, there are two demons that kind of fall under the power of the planet of Saturn. Um, that is Azazel, who's my favorite demon. Mm -hmm. Um, Azazel is one of the only few demons listed by name in the Torah. Um, when you get to the Septuagint and other translations of the Bible, like the Vulgate, King James, they actually... Um, translate his name into scapegoat so he's actually the demon who um, was summoned or invoked in these times when they were sacrificing a goat you know kind of that sacrificial lamb metaphor that we see often in jewish tradition Um, when you go to the apocrypha though and read some of the lost books of enoch um, azazel this is interesting i thought is kind of the the first angel of god to help seduce what are called the Grigori, or the Watchers of Heaven. He seduces them to fall to Earth and take bed with mortals. And thus we get the fallen angels and kind of the giant, the Nephilim, um, that we have in the Old Testament. But Azazel's also very prominent in studies. You summon him, you invoke him when you want to learn about the dark and forbidden arts. So his sigil in this oldest book ever written 
to me was kind of a nod to that they are looking to learn the darkest and forbidden arts, which oftentimes is necromancy. Saturn also is the planet of another demon known as Agiel, which is essentially just a soldier peon of Satan. He summons him when he wants to create war and vengeance, and kind of rage against the machine, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, the other sigil, though, that I saw is actually pretty prominent. It's the symbol, or the sigil, excuse me, of Leviathan, um, who is kind of the token demon of the seven deadly sins. He gets envy, um, and Leviathan is named in all versions of the Bible, all translations. Um, usually we associate him with this large, monstrous, underwater beast. Some scholars think like the giant squids or sharks. People attributed Leviathan to them. Um, but you also, this is kind of where scholarly Max starts to question Bible stories because Leviathan is also a prominent figure in Sumerian legends about the flood and Tiamat, the mother dragon, and this and that. So mm. anyway, that's the occult corner with Max. Wow. The only thing I have to add is something I looked up on IMDb. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> in the Book of Burr, I'm just going to read it straight up. because This is certainly not something anything I caught. In the Book of Burr, writer Keith Cooper added a fun line in Latin for anyone trying to read the book during the movie. It says, Tibi gratias ago tibi quia propequia este quaritis. And I feel comfortable. Impeccable. Oh, thank you so much. It's uh, 14 years of studying Latin. Um, the reason I feel comfortable trying to say that out loud from a demon book in a movie is because it translates to, thank you for looking so closely. <laughs> uh, you will not find that in any of the grimoires I've mentioned. No. Which are available on Amazon for two-day delivery. Um, if you want the fun ones, go to eBay. <laughs> Yeah, All are right. your books like, um, are they creepy looking or they just look like books? Uh, you know? I'll send you like, some pictures. They... Okay. I just I, I, I wonder if I, they have like thousands of like crinkly pages like this other one. In the movie. I mean, one of them, I think the pages are made out of human flesh. I haven't gotten that like verified yet. I'm just kidding. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what have I done coming on this podcast? <laughs> You might be the first guest that we've actually scared, so that deserves a medal. <laughs> I'm scared of chipmunks, it's fine. I mean, they're gross. They have lots of diseases, I get that. Very little teeth. All right, let's, <laughs> uh, let's finish up, Josh, before we lose any more of our listeners today about chipmunks. Um, how good of a movie would you rate this? Every time we, we talk about a movie, we give it a rating that we call crowns zero being terrible 10 being perfect where, mm -hmm. where would you mm -hmm. land anything for jackson i want to say does it have to be a whole number or can it be a half it can be a half okay i'll do 8.5 i gave it a nine um and, and i feel like that is very solid i i thought about giving it an 8.5 but i just sir got got a win for me and that was a win for all demons yeah yeah well i mean yeah i guess after hearing the occult corner no I, i'll stick with it because that's that's a weak thing to do i'm gonna say 8.5 a solid very solid 8.5 leaning nine it's 8.5.5 all right <laughs> it is a 8.9623 yeah um all right how about screams how scary was this movie for you um i gave it a seven for my personal screams and i gave it an eight i think the ghosts really were the best part of this movie mm -hmm. um the trick-or-treat ghost the contortionist the teeth lady all of those really the mix of special and physical kind of practical effects blew me away and really got to me yeah i think i went a little bit lower because i haven't had any i haven't had any like horrible dreams about them i think about the teeth lady all the time which is why the number's so high. Um, <laughs> but at, for me, like the things that scare me are very, very different from like the things that scare my wife. Like the conjuring scared the hell out of me. My wife watches it to relax. Yeah, um, the conjuring kiddo. We've, we've got to work on some scary movies with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the things that are scary to me are 
Well, I don't know. I don't even know anymore, okay, Max? <laughs> I am alone. Well, maybe you give me your wife's information if she thinks the conjuring's scary. We'd love to have her as a guest. <laughs> no, no, she finds it comforting. I find it scary. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's the um I think what makes a movie scary for me is less about the the jump scares. And more about the like the lingering thoughts about uh, life and death and humanity. Like for me, hereditary. Yes. Um, it stays scared, with you. Scared the living daylights out of me because of the tragedy that happens in it. And that it's it's the like you said, the human connection. I'm not worried that I'm going to accidentally summon a demon. So it's less scary to me than being worried that I'm accidentally going to have a, a sibling or a loved one doing something stupid outside the car and lose their life. Yeah. You know, and then the symbolic, you know, demonology and all all that stuff that happens in the movie is really to me about the, like the unraveling of the human self. When you, when you go through something so traumatic, you can't survive. That's the stuff that scares me. So that's why I give it a a seven instead of a, you know, a nine or eight. That's, That's great. All right, to end the episode, we just want to always go over what we're doing to stay spooky. So, Josh, tell me what horror media you're consuming lately that's keeping you on your toes. Yeah, I guess I guess there's like uh, work and there's pleasure. So TikTok is work <laughs> these days. So I'm taking the suggestions of TikTokers and watching as many of their suggestions as possible because they're lots of obscure movies I've never heard of and, and lots of like common movies that I've just never gotten to. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing for work. And then for pleasure, I've been kind of slowly reading the book heart shaped box. Oh, cool. Yeah. I like it so far. I'm like six chapters in, I'm a very slow reader because I like to read at the pace that I talk, which is slow. Um, Nathaniel is usually on the show reads like 700 books a year. It blows oh my, my mind. Oh my gosh. 700 is probably hyperbolic, but not very hyperbolic. So. Yeah, I could do like six, I think. Uh, yeah, a good like seven for me, maybe, on a good year. Um, I, last night, actually just watched another Shutter exclusive called The Power. Um, it's about this London infirmary back when they were having a lot of issues between kind of power companies and the government. And so uh, what the state did essentially is... There was a curfew, and after that curfew, everyone had to turn off their electricity. So the whole city went black. And it's about this poor girl. She's a nurse. She went to Catholic school as a kid. Her name's Valerie. And it's about her journey with sexual abuse and how that manifests in the dark. And her finding her voice and understanding that we should never stay in the dark when it comes to sexual abuse. Wow. Um, and it was an incredibly poetic movie that had horror and ghosts as its backdrop. And at the end of it, you just felt empowered to make sure that everyone's voice is heard and to not let anyone stay in the dark. Um, so it, I would recommend it to everybody. It's not the greatest horror movie ever made, but the message is just deeply powerful. That's fantastic. Yeah, I wrote that one down. Wow. Yeah, it's a good one. And if you don't like the dark, Josh. Good luck, because it, it definitely <laughs> plays with that in particular. Uh, cool. So. I like being scared. I've always liked it. I've always well, liked good. It. Stick with us, and you'll never be safe ever again. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Josh, I wanted to give everyone one last chance to know exactly where they can find you. So give us your social media blitz. Yeah, on Instagram, I'm haunting season. Not a whole lot happening there, but it's much easier to DM. Uh, on TikTok, it's haunting season, um, and that is uh, folklore, urban legends, hauntings, and scary movie reviews, uh, all with my beautiful face and voice as the incredible backdrop. Uh, YouTube, I am telling, writing and telling scary stories. It's haunting season, and there's a podcast called Haunting Season um, that's basically mirroring the, mirroring the YouTube, but pretty soon I'm going to start doing interviews on there. So whatever your platform is, I'm there, but I'm most active on TikTok. Awesome. All right. Without further ado, everyone, thank you so much. Stay spooky. Need even more Scream Kings? Here's our obligatory shameless social media plug. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Scream Kings Pod. 
You could also email us at ScreenKingsPodcast at gmail.com. Help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on iTunes or by sharing a link on social media. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash screen kings. Stay spooky.